Man, what are you guys like following me to the mailbox? <laughs> Jeepers creepers. <laughs> Let's see, yep, bills. Oh, voting card. Oh, look at that, a recall. You guys must have known there was a recall in the mail. Isn't that something? Hey, you know, what is a recall? What should we do with it? Well, today on Tech Garage, we're gonna take you behind the scenes of the dealership and show you exactly what to do when you get one of these in the mail. Hey, welcome to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, I have my lovely wife's Tahoe back in the shop, and that is for a reason, Dave. I went to the mailbox, I got a bill, a voter's thing here, you can use all that now. I got like a hundred of those, I'm gonna turn them all in. <laughs> exactly, here's the deal. I actually have this recall, and you've probably seen it laying around Tech Garage. Yes, this is the fourth one I got in the mail, so I think it's time we address it and bring the audience along with us. Yeah, a lot of these are, are simple things, like maybe the paint's bubbling, or there's something weird about the bumper, in this case, this was something that's actually a kind of a scary safety concern. Yeah, no doubt about it. You can see it right there on the graphic, you guys. The electronic power steering, EPS, the loss of the power steering. That's the first one, Dave. That's scary enough. Yeah, you don't want to lose power steering. <laughs> Driving down the road expecting to give it just a little bit of effort, and it's going to take a whole lot yeah. if you're making a left turn across traffic or something like that. Yeah, no doubt about it. The second one is increased brake pedal effort. And we went on the internet and we looked them up, did some research. You guys can find it, that end number up there. It actually shows what it is. And the first one was increased pedal effort. And after talking with the tech, I kind of find the nitty-gritty there. And it uses a vacuum pump to run the brakes, and the vacuum pump could start to get weak or fail, so they increase the pressure to the brake booster so you don't have that increased effort. It should take care of the problem. Just reprogramming. If there's anything I hate, it's having to use increased effort on anything. <laughs> so I want to make sure we get this one taken care of. Yep. And notice at the bottom it says no parts are required for this repair. So this is clearly just a computer sort of programming thing. Yeah, and, and you know all about the second one. It's the EPS loss of power steering assist. Scary thing, but uh, you know, simple fix. Simple fix, again, just a computer thing. This is just sort of recalibrating the system. We're sending something new with the program. Maybe there's a glitch in it, and uh, they just gotta take care of that with their, with their laptop. Absolutely, and you know, I, I use my cell phone so the footage isn't the best day, but they let me go behind the scenes, which was really cool, and we wanna take y'all along with us, so we just took the dealership, we took it down to the dealership, Dave. Where did it all start? If you haven't gotten a recall before, or maybe you've not paid attention to one before, but you wanna take care of one, you have to make an appointment, but the dealers will get you right in, especially if it is a safety concern. And that's what we did here. We made an appointment, went to our local dealership, Miller and Miller here in Mariana, Florida. Then we found the service department, that's where we took it. No charge, gotta love that. Recall came up, appointment was there. And then it was really cool. I thought he kind of walked out to the car. We do that all the time, Dave. Yeah, we preach this all the time, visual inspection. That's exactly what he was doing. First of all, he inspected the vehicle, went round and round to make sure there's you know, dents and scratches and things like that to sort of cover them should anything happen during, uh, during the procedure. And took a scan tool and looked to see if there were any codes being thrown by the vehicle. And guess what, John? Your vehicle had a code. And that's the scary part. Yeah, that's embarrassing. We had a C code. It was a chassis code. So the check engine light wasn't on the dash there, but I still should have caught it. It was a C0273, and that's a brake fluid level sensor problem. We'll just address that after the commercial. But he did find that as well. Then we took it back to the actual tech, Jamie Cozart. And I thought that was really cool, Dave. He actually put a battery maintainer on it. And I was like, well, that's kind of weird, but it could be programming for up to an hour. And he said, if it loses the actual charge of the vehicle, well, now your computer's a boat anchor. It's like programming a computer. You have to have a good power supply to do it. Once he had the battery maintainer hooked up, he went into the OBD2 port, just like you would scan for, for any kind of code. And he hooked his laptop up to the GMC tech line, which is something these guys do every day. They do do it every day. They actually fix a lot of cars that way, which surprised me, Dave. Push it a few buttons, man. He put the VIN in there, and guess what? Everything popped up, man. They know everything about you. They know your recalls. There it was. Bam, he was off to the races. And the first thing he went after was the power steering update. Turns out it was a problem with the programming of the computer. He just took care of that, reprogrammed it, and we we're good to go there. Small glitch. Second problem, he went to address that. Once again, reprogram it again. But that was interesting because when he reprogrammed that one, it actually started fresh, like putting a program on a computer. It actually lost the pedal position. So then he had to go relearn the pedal position with the scan tool, which was just another step, but got it in tip-top shape. After that, he had to clear all the codes because while he's downloading the software, every time you turn the key on, your car's doing a bunch of tests of all the systems. And while that stuff was downloading, it was getting all these false readings and things were coming back kind of bonkers. So once the procedure was done, he cleared the codes 
and it, he was only left with the original code that we had about the brake fluid level. Yeah, so if you get a recall, get it down to your local dealer. They'll take care of it, no problem. But Dave, they've done all the work so far. We need to get under the hood and address that C0273, and we'll do that right after the break. There's plenty more Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Thank you for tuning into Tech Garage. We hope you're enjoying the show because we have a great time making it. You can see some really fun behind the scenes stuff on our Facebook page every single week. And if you've missed an episode this season or any other, head on over to the Masters Entertainment Group website or YouTube page to get caught up. Keep it in part because Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com returns right after this. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is brought to you by NH Oil Undercoating, the official oil-based rust prevention system, and by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. In our last segment, we took our Chevy Tahoe in to service it because we had a couple of recalls, and in doing so, John, we found out we had a code, and it involved the brake fluid level sensor, not quite sure what's going on there. We'll check that out. But first, let's talk about brake fluid. Now, this isn't like the old days when you just took any old brake fluid, dumped it in, and for any car, it was you were good to go. No, you can't do that anymore. There's all types of brake fluid. But what's important, the higher the number, the higher the boiling point, and even more important, DOT5 is silicone-based. The other ones are glycol. They're not interchangeable. All right, that's why you want to check your manual to make sure you're getting the right brake fluid. Same thing goes with coolant and oil. Everything is different in every car these days. Now, let's talk about brake fluid. Brake fluid is hygroscopic. That means it absorbs moisture from the atmosphere. If you've got too much moisture, your brake fluid will no longer be effective. So we've got this testing tool from rockauto.com. Here's some brand new brake fluid. We're gonna take a look at it though. I'll dip this in here, press the button. We'll see how much moisture we have in this. It's reading 2%, John, and that still shows it as being uh, in the good level. You start to get to three and 4%, it is time to change your brake fluid. And brake lines contain copper alloys. So, over time, as the brake fluid starts to react with those copper alloys, you might end up with copper, it, you will end up with, with copper in your brake lines and in your brake fluid. So you wanna check for the copper content, you get these test strips like we got at rockauto.com. Dip them in there, again, this is new fluid so I don't really have to let it sit in there for a long time, but you let that sit for about 30 seconds or so and swish it around and you can check it right here on the package. If you look here, if it's yellow like this one is, that means your brake fluid's still good. The light pinks, you're still good. You start to get into this dark pink and into the purple, that means there's too much copper in your brake fluid, it's time to change it. Yeah, and ours is a fluid level sensor problem, and you could have different types. You have this one right here, and kind of looks like a toilet float, you said. Yeah, if it works at the toilet, it's gonna work here, same <laughs> principle. Perfect, and we have one here that's on this truck, and you probably heard this before, a little float floating down inside of there. You actually, the sensor here goes through the actual master cylinder on the side right there, but it's not contacting the fluid, there is a plastic in between it, but I cut one away, which is really cool. So you can see the float right there. Matter of fact, I could put it in my hand, there's a little magnet on it. So when the fluid goes low, it goes down, makes that magnetic field contact. Then the sensor reads it and it turns on that low fluid light. But we have a problem because we don't have low fluid and we have the light on. So follow the flow chart in true tech garage fashion. There you go, bam, everything down. We took the meter, we went ahead and made some of the circuit checks, Dave, but it was really interesting when I got down there. With the fuse jumper wire, I'm gonna jump the circuit, which is cool, because I'm just gonna simulate that there's low fluid. If that thing reads low, bingo, we got it. So Why the fuse, John? A fuse jumper wire is super important because you don't want to mess up a circuit. So if you put that in a wrong jump, it's going to blow the fuse instead of your computer. Perfect. Absolutely huge. So if I come over here and I unplug it, and I go across these two wires, just the positive one side and the other one going right to it, um, what I'm doing is I'm basically just simulating it, and there it is. Dave, you got low? That just went to low, John. There we go. So that low told us the wire harness, the computer, everything's good. Dave, we got a sensor problem just that easy. And man, I was really amazed. I thought for sure this was going to be a dealer item. Not the case. RockAuto.com. Voila, there it is. Perfect. Was that an aftermarket deal, John? No, this is actually AC Delco OEM equipment. 
That amazes me about Rock Auto. They have all the biggest brands and they have all the parts your car will ever need. And when we come back, we're gonna inspect our van from our Keep It or Crush It segment to find out what we're gonna do with that. We'll also check in at the Rock Auto desk to talk more about parts like this. Name brand parts you can only get at rockauto.com. Welcome back to Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. A couple weeks ago, we showed you three vehicles we brought in for our keep it or crush it. it. You love the crush I it love part. Crush it. <laughs> Whether we're gonna take these vehicles and flip them or if they're just not worth keeping. And we're finding all that out right now. This is the first vehicle we've worked on. Last week, we took a look at this Nissan van and you wanna check the lines, make sure there was nothing obviously out of shape. Uh, whether this vehicle's been in a wreck, you'd, you'd see it crabbing down the road. Also the gaps on the body panels and stuff like that. And we gave it a basic look over, but we brought it in here to the studio to get a better look at it, Josh. And what's the first thing you did when well, we got it up? We picked it up on the lift, checked the brakes out. The front brakes looked good, looked at the pads. The, actually, the splash guard was knocked off, so we had easy access to actually look at the belt. The belt was still in good condition. Moved to the rear. I checked the pad thickness on the thickness gauge, it was in the yellow. I'm not too concerned about that because the primary braking's on the front, still got plenty of life left in the rears. And then we took it up a little bit higher, and it was time to inspect the underside of the vehicle, and something we hadn't had a chance to look at yet. And the first thing we did, I just gave it a general look over, pretty rust free under there. It's a Florida vehicle, so it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, most of the rust was just on top of the humidity. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, we did see some surface rust on the exhaust. Right, but we just did a tap test. The main thing we're concerned about is rust inside of the mufflers and the baffles, make sure those are still intact. Tap those going up. You found something on, on your side. Well, it is totally insignificant as far as the function of the vehicle, but a big rattle from a heat shield under there, and that's the kind of thing that would freak somebody out if they don't know what's going on under the car. And that's one of the things I would think would make somebody want to sell a vehicle, thinking they've got a major problem, but really, in our case, all you have to do is, is bend it back up and put a washer on there and bolt it back on. But we moved up a little bit further, you know, tapped the muffler towards the front, but the big thing we need to be concerned about that would be an expensive fix is that catalytic converter. So we need to tap that, make sure there's no rattling going on, make sure nothing's broken down inside. This is good because it's got two cats. So if one's bad, you might as well replace both, but in this case, we're good to go. Excellent, and suspension bushings look good. First of all, we wiggled the control arms and those yep. felt, felt okay. We pushed up and down on that, just make sure, but if that bushing was shot, it'd be resting on metal to metal, have a lot of clanking and clunking, but those are good too. The transaxle at the front it had some oil on it, but you said it didn't seem too bad. I mean, with the miles on this thing, I mean, a little bit of seepage is gonna be okay. What we're looking for is just pouring out, dripping, constant puddle on the floor, and we're, we're good to go. Speaking of puddles on the floor, one thing we did notice outside is there was coolant underneath the vehicle. You could also smell that when you were driving it. So that would indicate either a problem with the radiator or with hoses going to it. Definitely a leak, but one thing I'm a little bit concerned about, I have Benjamin in the car. Go ahead and crank it, Benjamin. All right, that's good. We don't have anything. It's not starting. We got crank, but no, it's not even cranking. Sorry. And you, you drove it here. Drove it here. It started getting a little bit slower. Wrong, wrong. I thought it was a battery, um, but this is definitely a starter. Put a voltmeter to it. We have voltage going to the starter, so it's definitely a starter issue. But All you right. remember that coolant leak we had earlier? Yep. The Here's the problem. Okay. So look right on top. <laughs> yeah, I mean, pretty obvious. It's you can see where the coolant's been pouring out right here. It's obviously yeah. a crack on the top tank here. So we're going to just replace this radiator. All right. Then it's just a few bolts to get that thing out. Normally you have to take this top cross member off, yep. but Nissan was kind enough to engineer to where you can just pull these clips back okay. and slide this off. Yeah, there we go, yeah. Bring that bushing with me. Yeah, that's fine, yep, okay. bring it with you. Yeah, this one's shot anyway, look at that. Yeah. Falling apart. All, All right. right. So then we'll take a bolt off here, bolt off here. I'll remove the battery and I'll get to the battery tray. Okay. Yeah, we talked about you know, something like that heat shield underneath being an insignificant problem, but again, to the owner, somebody, especially somebody that's not that handy and isn't sure what's going on, that's, that's a distressing thing and they might want to get rid of it. And of course, they probably saw, we know they had a jug inside the vehicle and that means they probably, probably knew it was leaking and they were filling it up and probably thought they had a major problem on their hands. Yeah. People usually don't get rid of cars for fun. I mean, a lot of people, some people do, but people like myself, if you can keep it, you're gonna keep it. There's probably, the radiator is probably the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. 
We will continue to get this radiator out of here. When we come back, we're going to go over to the Rock Auto Desk to see what Tom has to help us fix this vehicle. And we also got a great garage ed coming up. You don't want to miss it. Well, we hope you're enjoying this episode of Tech Garage. I know we are, but you can also tune in to Motorhead Garage. Dave, you're a man of multi-talents, and Motorhead Garage, well, that's a great show. Well, the show's great because we show you all the latest technology and all the coolest aftermarket gear for your vehicle. It's the only place on TV that does that, John. Yeah, make sure you check them out on Sunday mornings at 8.30 a.m., only on Motor Trends. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is brought to you by Steel Rubber Products, quality crafted rubber parts and weather stripping, and by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Still rolling along here at Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Earlier in the show, we showed you on the Tahoe how we had a, a problem with the brake light, the ribble warning, it's the red brake warning light. And, and once that came on, we knew we had a brake fluid level sensor issue, and that's this little part right here, Tom. Mm -hmm. We went to the dealer, they didn't have it. And we were surprised to find that a dealer only item or what we thought would be, it was on rockauto.com. Yep, yeah, it's the same as for brick and mortar traditional parts stores. There's just so many different makes and models and, and model years and part numbers. There's just no way to stock it in one location. So that, that Rock Auto is perfect for that. Not only, we not only have that part, but we have a choice of brands, the OE brand and then a couple of famous brands. And, and here is, this is genuine GM parts. This is the OE brand right here. And there are three different choices, I think, of this particular sensor as well. And the thing that was fascinating, we showed you how this is magnetic. It doesn't actually touch the fluid. There's a, a sort of a, a plunger or a bobber in there, if you will. Are there other sensors on vehicles like this today? Yeah, they used to use a, a plunger where it was actually something floating in the fluid, and the fluid drops and the, the plunger goes down. But yeah, the, the sensor that never touches the chemical engine oil level works the same way. It's, a, it's often larger, but yeah, the same technology. RockAuto.com keeps up with the latest technologies but also goes way, way back. Your catalog extends way back to the dawn of the automobile. <laughs> yep. what, what kind of cars are we looking at? Classics, uh, of course. Yeah, but most of our customers are buying parts for their daily drivers. They drive every day, but if you have an old car or, or a classic going back to the early 1900s, we can help. Well, rockauto.com has all the parts your car will ever need, no matter how old or how new the car is or how big or how small the part may be. Let's see what John Gardner's up to over there. Well, it always amazes me what they have at the rockauto.com desk, and that includes air conditioned parts. This garage ed is all about the TXV thermostatic expansion valve and the orifice tube, the pressure differences of the system of where it's gonna change from a high pressure to a low pressure. Let's take a look at this graphic right here. You can actually see the orifice tube system. Now it all starts at the compressor. And a couple of weeks ago, Josh taught us about that compressor where it's actually taking that gas in as a low pressure gas and changing it to a high pressure gas. And as it does that, it actually heats it up, sends it down to the condenser. Now the condenser is taking that high pressure gas and it's changing it, it's condensing into a liquid and it's giving off the heat to the outside. It's actually throwing it off, comes out a liquid and then it goes over to that orifice tube. And Josh, that's what it's all about today. Tell me about the orifice tube. That's right, John. Generally speaking, it comes in on this side. This side usually filters it and then it comes out on this side where there's a finer mesh, helps atomize the refrigerant so you get a better, more efficient cooling capacity with your refrigeration system. So if you look over here at this one, this one's clogged up pretty good. You're not gonna have good refrigerant flow, it's gonna be clogged, and your AC performance is going to suffer. Now if your AC performance is suffering, you determined you need a, a different orifice tube, sometimes you have to replace the entire line to be able to replace that orifice tube. So in our case right here, I have to buy this whole line, just to get the orifice tube. But if you're lucky enough, you might can replace the orifice tube yourself and just pull it out with needle nose pliers. Sometimes they're locked in there. If they're locked in there, you have to get a special tool that'll grab onto it, give it a little twist, it locks on, and you pull it right out and you can replace that orifice tube. Or you may have a TXV system, a thermostatic expansion valve. Now let's take a look at the graphic there as well. See the compressor again. Once again, send in that refrigerant, which is hot, gas down to the condenser and that condenser changes states this time it goes through an actual receiver dryer 
up to that TXP or thermostatic expansion valve. Now I got a cutaway right here that's really cool and I can show you how it works. This one is a precise measuring device. The orifice tube, well that's just fixed. What happens and goes through there is what you get. This one is precise, why? Well we have this sensing bulb right here and this thing's on the outlet of the evaporator. Perfect place to sense temperature. That lets the TXV either open or close precisely and allows that refrigerant in or out of that evaporator controlling the temperature. Now you can also have this as an H block. It's the same principle. It's a TXV here kind of built in right here in the system to where the refrigerant's going to go through. Well, whether you have a TXV, a thermostatic expansion valve, or an orifice tube, that's the control device you need to keep the temperatures and pressures right in your system. Well, that's a wrap for Garage Ed. Let's head over to Dave and wrap this whole show up. All right, well, I cleared the codes on the Tahoe here. Cycle the key, check for codes again. No more codes, that means this Tahoe is ready to roll down the road problem free, John. Yeah, and that's a good thing because this is my wife's Tahoe and I have to bring it home to her and I may wear this lab coat home, Dave. <laughs> that is none of my business. <laughs> that's a whole other subject. But hey, you guys, you want to join us next week because we're going to have some audience participation. And man, I hate to say this is, oh, my Lincoln Town Car I said was bulletproof is making a racket. Listen to this. We don't know what that sound is, and we're hoping you might have a guess, so you can email us at feedback at techgarage.tv. Tell us what you think the problem might be. We're going to find out together. Yeah, we will, and we'll read your emails on the air, so get them in quick. Next week, we'll tackle the town car, but for this week, we're done. So we'll see you next time for more Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Where do I get one of those? Yeah, right? Production assistance provided by Chipola College in Mariana, Florida. Chipola was founded in 1947 and it was recently ranked among the top three community colleges in the United States.